And then they say, I think it was outside because a very poor communication said 500, 600, alto, alto, order del alto mando, order from the high command, 500 and 600. We had a very simple code, 500 Che Guevara, 600 dead, 700 keep him alive. Okay. I asked twice, 500, 600, they wanted him killed. So when Centeno came before he left, I called him and said, mi, mi coronel, there is order from your high Bolivian command to eliminate the prisoner. We received the order 500, 600 from your people. My instruction from my, from my government is to try to keep him alive at all costs. It's very important for us. We'll have helicopter and plane to fly him to Panama for interrogation. He looked at me and said, Felix, we have worked empirically. We're very grateful to you. But this is order from my president, my commander in chief. He looked at his watch and said, the, when I leave, the helicopter is going to come several times, bringing food and ammunition and taking our wounded and our dead. After two o'clock in the afternoon, it's going to come to pick up Che Guevara's dead body. You can use to see him any way you want because we know how much harm he has done to your country. So the coronel tried to make them change their mind because it's very important to us. But I give you my word of honor that, that if there is not a counter order, I will bring you the dead body of Che. They told me that I said, you can use to see him any way you want because we, we know how much harm has done to your country. Yeah. But, and he left. Sure enough. The helicopter came. One time, that's what that picture was taking. Because I never even thought about getting a picture with him. What? I was talking to him when here come the pilot. Jaime <clears throat> Nino Guzman said, Mi Capitan, Mayor, Mayor Saucedo wanted a picture with the prisoner. And he got the 35 millimeter camera from the, from the head of intelligence. So I look and say, Commander, do you mind? I say, no. So that when we helped him, I was the one who helped him. We, I hold him. He was limping a little bit because of the bullet he had in his leg. We went around the, the, uh, the uh, schoolhouse. We sat in there. This is just right now. The door is in this way here, about here. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the little bit of, of, of a wall. that it, It's not even a building behind that. This is empty behind this. Okay. Uh, and and we, we, I, got my cam I gave my camera to, uh, to the uh, pilot, Jaime Nejo Guzman. He was the one who took the picture. Just before that picture was taken, I put my hand around Chen and said, Comandante, mira el pajarito, look the little bird. We tell that in Cuba, to los niños, you know. Look at the little bird, look at the pajarito, to take a picture. And he was laughing. To get kids to smile. Yeah, he, no, he was laughing. He right. laughed. And I look at the camera. I thought, actually, when I sent this picture to the CIA who was embedded in, in, in one of the roles that I put in X, I told the guy from the agency in La Paz, I said, look, this is a roll of picture of me with Che where Che is laughing. Because I thought I was laughing at the time the picture was taken. But he, he changed for that expression. Seconds before that, he was laughing like hell. What did, what was the conversation like between you and Che after you got the order that he needed to be killed? Did no, I didn't did, tell him anything. You didn't tell him anything? No, no. I started waiting to see what happened. I went by, we spoke several times on and off. Wasn't, then, there, wasn't there a moment about, when you... No, the, let me tell you. Even I thought, you know, in myself, talking to myself, all right, they want him alive. How about if I call the landline, telephone line when the helicopter comes, and I tell the pilot that my government convinced uh, your government to keep him. I, we just got a phone call, said to change order, that my government uh, have been, we were able to convince your government to keep him alive. And if they tried to call a the line, they could not communicate with it. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Then I thought to myself, hey, remember what happened with, when Batista released Fidel that December, what happened to Cuba? And I told myself, you are here, actually you're here to advise, right. not to be the commander. <laughs> and I told myself, if you do that and you are successful and he's released, eventually, and he goes to another country, a lot of people get killed because of him, you are going to be responsible. And that's not your responsibility. It is the responsibility of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Bolivian, let history run its course. So I didn't do anything else to save his life at all. And then I started waiting to see what happened. Then it, uh, just the, the helicopter was gone, here come this lady about, I don't know, it was, um, one twelve thirty, twelve forty in the in the uh, in the afternoon with a radio. Mi capitán, mi capitán, why are you going to kill him? I say, Senora, why do you say that? I said, Look, we just saw you being photographed with him in front of the schoolhouse. Look, the radio already gave the news that he died from combat wounds. And he was still alive. 
So at that time, I, you know, there's not going to be any counter order. So I got into his room, I stood in front of him, he was sitting in the bench, he looked at me, I looked at him. Uh, he said, Commander, I'm sorry. I tried my best. It's order from the High Bolivian Command. The guy looked at me and he turned white like a piece of paper. I had never seen somebody whose face turned white. I mean, literally white, like the blood had drained out of his face. He didn't move a muscle. And then he said, it's better this way. I should have never been captured alive. And then he got the pipe and said, I'd like to give this pipe to a soldadito who treated me well. Now he got the pipe. When I arrived, he wanted to smoke. He didn't have picadura from tobacco. So I asked a soldier to give me a couple of cigarettes. So he got the regular cigarette. He opened it up and put the, uh, what was inside the cigarette inside the pipe. And then he, he smoked with me. I allowed him to smoke from cigarette because we didn't have a, right. a, a pipe, um, a smoke for the pipe. So, so I wanted to, then I said, uh, at that point in time when he said that Sergeant Teran, we knew was the one executing people, burst into the room. Yo quiero la pipa, mi capitán, yo quiero la pipa. And she said, no, a ti no te la doy. Digo, salga de aquí. Que yo quiero la pipa, mi capitán, salga de aquí. She had the pipe here. When he went out, I said, I look at him and say, Commander, would you give it to me? He suffered a few seconds and said, a ti si te la doy. I will give it to so I got the pipe, I put it here. Is there anything you want for your family? Then I would say it in a sarcastic way, he said, well, if you can't tem tell Fidel that he will soon see a triumphant revolution in America. And then he changed and said, and you can tell my wife to remarry and try to be happy. That was the last way. So very emotional. Um, and me especially because well, I have never ordered anybody which is in prison being killed. This was a very unique and very unusual circumstances. So it, it was emotional, tremendously for me, that, that moment in sea. So we looked at each other, he came to where I was, we shook hands, looked at each other's face, he embraced me, I embraced him, hard. Then he left go, he stood in attention, I looked at him, I went back, we sh I shook his hand again, I embraced him, and I left. And I, it was hard. I hope I never had to go through that again. And then the, I went out, it was Sergeant Terran was next to the other officers in there. And I told him, I say, the, uh, Sargento, do not, they're ordered from a high Bolivian command to eliminate the prison. Don't shoot from here up. Mm -hmm. Shoot from here down because this man's supposed to die from combat wounds. See me, Capitan, see me, Capitan. It was exactly one o'clock in the afternoon because I looked at the watch when I left. I walked toward the area where I was photographing the diary. I sat in the bench taking some note. At 1.15, I heard a short burst of machine gun fire. It was an, M an M2 carabine. He borrowed, because the, the soldier have a regular guard, he borrowed the automatic, full automatic M2 carabine from Lieutenant Perez, who was next to him. It was a lieutenant that was very, very, very short, very small. And uh, it was one, 115, I took note. Then I went in there, you know, and I would say it, uh, for a long time, maybe two, three hours later, here come Gary Prado and Cesar Torelli, two captain, and then I joined them and we go into the room. When we arrived into the room, his body was like this sideways. This door was like, like this. His head is looking at the, at the ceiling. The two dead bodies were still there and uh, his face was covered with mud. Now the, 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 the floor is dirt, it's mud in there, very humid, okay? Uh, the walls were made out of um, clay, type of clay or dirt, mixed it with a little stone and some, some uh, thing from the trees. So mm -hmm. that's the way they mix together. And it's very, very, I uh, say, insulating, you know. It, it really keeps the cold out or keeps the heat out. It's very, very insulating. And then, of course, they had the straw on, on top of the, it. The wall itself had some straw, some small stone. Because mm -hmm. I brought a bunch of those, those stones later on when I went back, finally brought a bunch of that back home before they destroy the, the house in the other side. So <clears throat> here we are, I asked them, uh, I could hear the helicopter coming. Uh, well, they don't know, they, they meet, when they heard the helicopter coming, they left, both of them, all right? Now, when we came in, Celso Torrelli had a little stick, he said, you son of a bitch, you have killed so many of my soldiers. And then we embraced on top of the body, and Gary Prado said, mi capitán, hemos acabado con las guerrillas en América Latina. We have finished the guerrilla in Latin America. And told him, mi capitán, if we have not finished them, at least we have delayed them for a long time. They hear the helicopter, they took off immediately. 
So I asked to a soldier who was there to bring me a bucket of water uh, because fake was covered with mud. So I got a bucket of water and uh, I, I sat next to him. I got up with my hand. I cleaned all his face. I completely took all the blood out of his face, uh, completely the mud out of his face. Uh, I tried to close his jaw with my handkerchief, which I lost with the air of the helicopter. It was successfully closing in there, but then, we, then I lost and I went back again. I tried unsuccessfully to close the eyes several times, put it back in, went back on. It, I, I've been up in about more than two hours or so. Is that normal? Yes. When you, are, when you are so long, even you have to try to move an arm, you won't. They, they, they are, they are, they are, right. at, at the beginning, yes, you can move it. If it was maybe a few minutes, you can keep it a while and it will stay there. When there are several hours, it's already frozen that way. You can bring it down, but when you let it go, it goes up again. So I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't close the eye. This I could. But then with the air of the helicopter, I lose my handkerchief. And when you see the picture, his, his uh, jaw is down mm. in there. So I got the body. The two captains left. He didn't want the helicopter to see or anybody take picture with him and the body. I took the, uh, the, the body on one side, two soldiers on the other side. We took it to the left, right pontoon of the helicopter. While I was trying to tie it down, El Mayor Niño de Guzman, the pilot semi capitán move him forward to balance a little bit the helicopter, apparently it's a little bit too deep. So I put my hand under him, and it was a, a una camilla, a treasure under it, uh, it's plastic, and I pull it out. When I got the hand out, I could not see it, completely covered with blood. Apparently the, the one of the bullets hit the aorta, and it was a big pool of blood. When this thing is plugged, it doesn't allow the liquid to go down, the, uh, to drain down. I didn't say a word, but I thought to myself, I said, in my mind, they are persons that have a lot of blood in their hand. I had a hell of a lot of. So I didn't say a word. I just thought that it came to my mind. Then I, I cleaned the, the blood on the right side of my pen. I went down and continued to, to tie the helicopter, tie the, the thing around his, uh, which I lost with the air of the helicopter. I jumped into the helicopter a little bit to the left to balance the helicopter on the, on the lone ship. And at that point, a soldier came saying, Mayor, Mayor, Father Chiller want to see him. So we stayed like two, three minutes with the engine running. Here come this priest and, and riding a mule all the way around. He was fairly close to being decapitated because we were in a little bit lower ground than the, where, where he was coming from. But just this much from the play, he came down from the mule. He went a little bit closer and then twice. He, he, which I took picture of it with my Minox camera. That's the only one that I have left. I thought to myself, this guy was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. Nevertheless, he, he received the last ritual from the Catholic Church. Wow. And then we took off. And we took off for... Um, and let me tell you, there were times that we were talking. I wasn't paying any attention. Be honest with you. I don't know what he was saying. I was looking at this guy in front of me. The guy looks like a beggar. It's a guy who didn't have uh, proper clothes. He, the, he had a, a, a jacket who was in, 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 in racks, f filthy. Uh, the hair was filthy. Uh, he didn't have any pair of boots. He had some, some couple of, 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 uh, of leather very badly tied down to his, to his foot like, like, like shoes. They weren't shoes. Very, very. It, it look, it, to a point, it, 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 you feel sorry for some individual like that. I felt sorry for the guy. Yeah. And my mind, when he was talking, I wasn't even paying attention to what he was saying. My mind was, well, I, I never met him personally, but I remember him when he visited the Soviet Union, when he visited Mao Zedong in China. Uh, I remember that guy, which seems to me much taller than what he was right there now, uh, with this big uh, abrigo, you know, this the cover coat with the leader of the Soviet Union and the leader of China very arrogant talking, and, and looking at this guy, it could not be the same person. It's impossible. I mean, it, 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 it strikes so different, too different what I was looking at and what I knew or remember from right. him and that. So it wasn't, it wasn't the, but it was probably one of the hardest moments of my life uh, to, to go through with that decision. I knew I had to do it. It was no other question about it. I hope I never have to do it again. I never will, hopefully. Did you re did you really respect him? Did you in that moment? Did you have some respect for Look, him? When, when a guy when a guy accepts his faith and, and he died like a man, 